Well, we have a special guest this morning, and I know everybody has the same question. Why in the world did I invite a priest to come speak in a Baptist church? <laughs> Let me tell you the story. You know that I'm friends with, with Eric Manati over at the Lutheran Church. Luther, uh, he called me up one, one day, and he said, Phil, I want you to meet somebody. I said, okay. He said, let's have lunch. And I want you to meet this Catholic priest. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll be there. So, uh, as usual, I got there 10 minutes early. And um, I told them that I was waiting for some people. They said, oh, we'll go ahead and seat you. So they, they took me in the back to the back table. They had a back table back there. And I sat there. I could see the door. And at uh, exactly 12 o'clock, I saw this man come in. And he looked like he might be a Catholic priest because of what he was wearing. So... I mentioned to him, come on back, and he came on back. And, of course, Eric and, 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 uh, and Tom, the preacher from uh, Church of Christ, they're, they're always late, <laughs> always. And so we had about 10 minutes to talk. We'd never met each other. We just started talking. And immediately I thought, this man is not a Catholic. He's a Bible-believing, preaching Baptist. <laughs> I, was, I was very impressed the first time I met him, and I've met him several times since then, and I think you're going to be impressed too. Uh, he's a man of God, and I think you'll enjoy what he has to say today. Brother Will Combs, would you come on up? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you. Praise God. Well, I really want to thank you all uh, for this privilege to be here. Uh, it's a tremendous privilege. Um, and I come as, as a needy Christian. I'm a, um, the, that's the theme for today is needy Christianity. I come with, a, with an urgency. I come with a, I come with a desperation. Uh, and I have really three messages I want to share with you today. The first is to really thank you the second is to say, I, I really need you. Um, and the third is, I'm asking for your help. Um, not your money, but I'm asking for help. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a needy Christian with a lot of needs. Um, so I invite you, if you want to open your Bible, mine's probably a little different from, from maybe you have the same translation. Mine's New Revised Standard Version. I hope that's, that's okay, version. So if you want to open with me to your Bibles, kind of, or listen along. And let's really pray that not just Pastor Phil, but all of us have new ears, right? We have new, new hearing aids that we can really listen to the Holy Spirit. Let those who have ears to hear really listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches today. So you can turn to me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, one of my favorite passages. Uh, as I imagine it's a favorite passage for many. Chapter 12, let's start with verse 12 of 1 Corinthians. Here's Paul, he's speaking to the, the people, the Corinthians, and he says... He writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. Uh, could we add Baptist or Catholic, right? And we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the body, whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the, head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, 
And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need these. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, so that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. The word. May it be the living word of God. Amen. 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 Well, my first message is to really thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for, uh, for being Christian. I love Christians. I love people who love Jesus. Right? If you love Jesus, I consider you part of my family, part of my body. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful for your faithfulness and your fruitfulness. And as much as you're reading the Word of God and treasuring the Word of God and trying to put the Word of God into practice, I really want to thank you. Um, so I'm going to share you a little bit of my testimony. And by, by sharing my testimony, I really hope that we become one testimony to San Antonio and to the world, that we become light for the world, um, that we become a testimony of, of the gospel, of the good news. I was born and raised uh, Presbyterian. And I really love those songs. Good choice with those songs. Great choice. I love those songs. Sang those songs growing up in my Presbyterian church. I used to wear a robe in the choir. So, um, and I went to a, a, a boys' camp, a YMCA camp, and we sang uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So I was like, yeah, boy, I'm back home. It's really great to be back home. And I really want to thank you for your, your hospitality. I admit, it's, it's probably not uh, usual that you have a, a Catholic, let alone a Catholic priest, come to a Baptist service. But I really want to appreciate you for willing to listen to me and hear me out. Um, and I'm, I became very desperate at the age of, of 18. When I left my family, um, I'm from New Jersey, um, and I went to Maine, Bowdoin College, good eight hours away, and uh, wonderful upbringing, wonderful mom and dad, two older sisters. I was baptized at the age of 10, remember my baptism well. But when I went to college, all of a sudden I was like, sweetie, we love you very much, but you know, you gotta grow up. You can't live at home, you know, you gotta kinda grow up. And I understood that, but for me, it was my childhood is, is now dead. It's, it's just, just a memory. <laughs> my family's just a photo, and my parents are just a phone call, <laughs> and home is just a vacation, and now I'm alone. Alone in this world. I was overwhelmed with grief, I was overwhelmed with desperation and fear, and in desperation, I, I said, God, save me. God, save me. <laughs> Do whatever you want. Just prove that you exist. Prove that you care. Prove that you love me. Because if you don't, I mean, what's the use of living? And I knew suicide wasn't the answer, but what is? I desperately need a savior. I mean, everything's going to die. So, I mean, I need someone who's risen from the dead. By chance, anyone here know anyone who's risen from the dead? <laughs> and so thanks to the Christian fellowship, of Bowdoin College. You know, they, they kind of comforted me and they helped me along. and They taught me some important passages of the Word of God and I began my journey. Uh, and It's been a, a, a long journey, but in some ways I've just begun. And so uh, I thank you. I really thank you for your faithfulness, for your witness. And that's, and that's my second message. Is, my second message is I really need you. You know, we're, we're okay. For the body... <laughs> One member needs the rest of the body, you know? You can't say, I do not need you. I need you. <laughs> you see, a, a thumb can't be a thumb without the hand, and a hand can't be a hand without the arm, and the arm can't be an arm without the shoulder, and I cannot be a Christian without you. I need you. Um, and I learned in a very beautiful way <laughs> how much I need the body of Christ. You see, what had happened in college is I became so much with love with Jesus. I mean, I'd just pray every day, and it was good about each day. Thank you. What was not good? What did I do wrong? Forgive me, God. How can I become a better person? And I was starting to walk with Jesus, and I began with Genesis, and I was walking my way through the Scripture, three chapters a day, and I was falling in love with God. And my third year, I went, to, I went abroad. I went to Ecuador, to South America. 
And it was time, <laughs> I was reading Matthew by then, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24, if you remember, that's the, the apocalypse, you know, about, you know, about the, the crisis. That's got, eventually the Son of God will return with all these earthquakes and everything and famine and war. And it was at the same time as the first Gulf War, if you remember, that was back in 1991. Uh, and uh, I think the world's coming to an end. <laughs> so it's quick. I gotta live the gospel really right now before it's too late, you know, <laughs> before hopefully he won't get too upset with me when he comes, you know, because he's a God of, of, of righteousness. He's a God of justice. He's a God of judgment. And I'll have to give an account on that day. And I was aware of that. So I said, okay, I gotta live the gospel now. So I told my parents, mom and dad, I love you very much, but I decided to drop out of college. Instead, I'm gonna just stay here in Quito, Ecuador. Um, I'm gonna live among the poor people. I'm gonna preach the gospel because the world's coming to an end. Oh, by the way, I love you, goodbye. <laughs> and of course, they were desperately praying for their son to have another conversion uh, back to college. But I was in Quito, Ecuador, and so five days after they left, they came down to visit me, but after they left, and of course I was weeping because it was really tough, but I knew this is what I had to do. I really had to prove that God, no, I'm really serious. I really do want to follow you. I really want to be your servant. I want to be your, I want to be your friend. I really want to be faithful to your word. I want your word to become flesh in my life. I want to live the gospel. So five days afterwards, there's, I'm having a nice, nice night with my friends, and I'm going back to the, the guest house I'm saying, and I see this guy pushing a pickup truck. And I said, okay, I gotta be the good Samaritan, gotta live the gospel now, I'll help him, I'll help him start his pickup truck. And so we start, couldn't get it started, so I just walked off, but I felt kind of guilty. You know, doesn't it say something like in scripture about you have to walk an extra mile? Okay, so I'll go the extra mile and help him. And then some undercover cops came with rifles and they beat the daylights out of him and then they told me to come over here and they're about to shoot me. I said, okay, okay, so they beat me up too with the back of their rifle. I was a bloody mess on the streets of Quito, Ecuador. And and, uh, and then they, the, the, finally the police car came and they threw us in the trunk of the car and I had a wonderful uh, weekend in <laughs> the beautiful deluxe jail of Quito, Ecuador. See, little did I know the guy was stealing the pickup truck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so big mistake, be careful whose pickup truck you help, right? I just, it's, it's a good lesson right there. And I learned there in jail that I could not live the gospel alone. And so my future godparents, my madrina e padrino, thanks to them, I'm not in prison right now, I'm out of jail, they got me out just in time. Uh, on Sunday night, I, I, from Friday to Sunday, and it was a big lesson. I realized it's not just Jesus and me, it's Jesus and we. <laughs> and I need the we. I cannot live the gospel without his family, which is the church which are the baptized believers. Huh? <laughs> and there, there are many reasons why I, I fell in love with the Catholic Church. I still do. Um, but the Catholic Church needs help. You see, we, the Catholic Church needs you. <laughs> see, we have different names. We have the same last name, you know. Catholic Christian, Baptist Christian. We talk about Lutheran Christian, you know, non-denominational Christian. We, okay, we've got different first names. We got the same last name. So when I became Catholic, I was not rebaptized. You know, when they learned that I was Presbyterian and I was baptized, oh, okay, well, don't touch that. <laughs> You're already baptized. You're already a member of the body of Christ. You're already a member of the church. Okay, there's, there's more sacraments like communion and that, okay. So there was some preparation I had to do. But they, all Catholics honor if you've been baptized by water, by one person, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're a member of the baptized body of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what we just read, huh? In one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Mm -hmm. So us Catholics honor you Baptists. You are members of the one body of Christ. So just like I need you, I hope that makes sense, the Catholic Church needs you. <laughs> We need your help. Because we are required and called by God to live the gospel. And I realized in jail, I cannot live the gospel alone. I need the whole body of Christ. And I really love the Catholic Church. I do, for many reasons. But as much as I love the Catholic Church, you know, there's some of those beautiful hymns. We don't, unfortunately, we don't sing some of those hymns in our Catholic Church. So <laughs> thank you for inviting me. See, so let's, let's go a little deeper into 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says right here in verse 7, um, 
To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Again, verse 11, it says, All those, all these gifts, the gifts, are activated by the one and same Spirit who allots each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. And in other words, the Holy Spirit is given to all baptized believers of Christ Jesus. And he gives, the Holy Spirit gives his gifts to all the members, not just to Catholics and not just to Baptists, but to all Christians. So I love the Holy Spirit. And the, what happened after I was set free from, got out of jail, you know, free card, I got out of jail, and I began to read Acts of the Apostles for the first time, which is all about the Holy Spirit. It's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and they were powered with the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. I said, that's what I want. And I was, in a sense, baptized anew with just a powerful experience of, of the Holy Spirit, of God's love. And I've been praying ever since, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit is saying to me is, if you want the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then go to Delview Baptist Church. (laughs) Because you have gifts of the Holy Spirit that I don't have. You know, I, 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 Jesus, I love you so much, but I don't love you enough. How can I love you more? He says, well, we'll go, go to... (laughs) Gather all my Christians together and make a big, beautiful symphony of praise. You see, I can't, I can't sing the Handel Messiah by myself. I need the violins, right? <laughs> and I need the cellos, you know? I, I need the drums, I need the guitars, I need the flutes. I, we need all the instruments only together with all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Can we give God the glory he deserves? I'm coming to say, I need you. I need your help. I, need, I certainly need your gifts. But you yourself are a gift. You yourself are a precious member of the body of Christ. So I come to thank you. I come to, to say, I, I need you. And I'm here to ask you. I'm really here to ask you for help. I need help. I cannot live the gospel without you. And, I hope it's not a surprise, but the Catholic Church cannot live the full gospel to the full without you. We need you. We need you to be good Baptists, good Baptist Christians who really live the gospel, that you teach us Catholics by your example, that you teach us how to make the word flesh (laughs) by living like Jesus, to be the image and likeness of Jesus, so you'll inspire us Catholics to become better. We need your, we need your, in, your help becoming better Christians, becoming more like Jesus. I'm here to ask you for, for mercy. I'm here to ask you for, for forgiveness. You might be wondering why I'm wearing this, this, this costume. <laughs> it's not a costume, it's a habit. <laughs> um, but I first... I, I first wore in Halloween. That's when, the, that's when it first arrived. You see, I, here's the story. Is I was trying to find my place in the body of Christ. Okay, Catholic. Now, so, so where do I belong? So I went to different places, you know, to, back to Maine, East L.A., down to Mexico, um, Alabama. And then finally, in 1996, when I was 26 years old, I came here to San Antonio to join the Brothers of the Beloved Disciple. And we have a real devotion to the Holy Spirit, living in the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit. And... Um, And so (coughs) this is a habit that uh, a number of us wear in our community. There's there's six of us, and we live right at St. Mary Magdalene Parish. We moved there in 2000. St. Mary Magdalene Parish, I don't know if you've ever been there or driven. Of course, you've probably driven by it according to I-10. It's right off of I-10, West Avenue. Um, We've got a nice gym, and there's the the church on the top. And uh, if you ever go there, you're certainly welcome. You'll see it's under construction. So the whole church is under construction including the pastor. So right here, I'm the pastor. The pastor's under construction, be, <laughs> and I need mercy. I need, I need forgiveness, and I, our whole church needs mercy. Uh, that is St. Mary Magdalene. The whole Catholic Church needs mercy. We need your mercy. Huh? So it's, it's full of meaning. That's what, that's what these habits are. You know, yeah, usually the priest wears a Roman collar, okay? He wears black and white. The, the black is, is, is here, and that's the most important thing I really want to point out. It's like a, a wedding ring. Anyone here have any wedi- wedding rings? Any of you married? Any, 
Okay, what is, right, your wedding ring is an outward sign of an interior reality, right, to love and be faithful to your spouse, right? Well, in a sense, this is my wedding ring. Okay, it's a little, perhaps a little loud. Um, in fact, we had one much more simple, but back, we've been talking about it as a community, so the past uh, year, we, we decided to put this on, and I went for a long walk, you know, actually a long run, and you know, I, I talked to a guy and said, you know, do I really have to wear this? I mean, it's kind of awkward. <laughs> You know, it's, it's inconvenient, it's uncomfortable, it's, um, you know, I'll stick out, I won't fit in, you know, um, and I'm drawing attention to myself, and, you know, and praying it through, and kind of, yeah, with, with hearing aids, really kind of listening to the Holy Spirit, I was sensing the Holy Spirit was saying to me, yeah, those are good reasons why you should wear it, because <laughs> it's, it's inconvenient, right? it's, it's uncomfortable, it's a reminder that there's something more important than convenience and comfort which is love. Jesus says, if you, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross. That's not too comfortable. But if we don't deny yourself, how can we become a gift of self to others? Right? It's, it's a reminder of, of, of black. Black is a reminder of penance. If you remember from the Gospel of, uh, actually in the Old Testament, let's go to the Old Testament, we see Jonah. Jonah's preaching, repent in Nineveh, or you'll be doomed. And what does Nineveh do? They cover themselves with ashes, and they're completely black. Remember Job. He loses everything, and he too, he goes down to the ground, and he covers himself with ashes. So you've ever seen Catholics on Ash Wednesday, right? They wear a nice black cross right here. Okay, well, that's what this is. This is black, and the black is a reminder of ashes. It's a reminder of repentance. I'm coming here repenting and asking you for mercy. Um, I don't know if there's any, any ex-Catholics here who were born and raised Catholic. I, I hope you had a good experience, but in all honesty, there's some ex-Catholics that have not had a good experience. Yeah. I, had a, I have a wonderful experience, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning, of course, that many don't. Many have been hurt or wounded, or they felt empty. They weren't being fed in the Catholic Church. They were so hungry for Jesus, and they didn't, they, they didn't feel well-fed. And then they came here to Delville Baptist Church, and they're being well-fed. Okay, I, I honor that. If you have a love and a hunger for Jesus, I thank you. <laughs> I say I need you. And I'm here to ask you for forgiveness on behalf of the Catholic Church. In any way, us Catholics have failed to live the gospel. I ask you for forgiveness. I ask you for mercy. I mean, it's easy to condemn. <laughs> it's easy to curse the darkness. But instead, we're called to turn on the light <laughs> and become light for one another. And by you becoming good Baptist Christians, you become light to us Catholics, and you inspire us, challenge us to be better Christians, to be better followers, disciples of Jesus. Um, we turn to the, the Last Supper, this beautiful scene, the Last Supper. And Jesus gives us a, he gives us a, a commandment, he gives us a, a promise, and he gives us a prayer. His commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. He gives us a, a promise. Yeah. The world will know that you're mine by your love for one another. And then the prayer, Father, may they be one as we are one, then the world will believe. So my family, I'm the only Catholic in my family. I have a wonderful family, but they're, they're still Presbyterian. My sister's Anglican. I have atheists in my family. I don't know if you have any atheists in your family, but one of their arguments is how can us, atheists, you call us a fine, how can we believe in you Christians if you don't love one another? <laughs> if you don't, if you're not reconciled with one another? If you're not one witness, how are we supposed to believe? And Jesus confirms that, saying, if you're one, then the world will believe. So pray that my brother-in-law is right, will believe <laughs> when they see us Christians in San Antonio reconciling and becoming one. I really think one of the sins in general of us Christians is... Um, yeah, maybe we're not desperate enough. Maybe we're not needy enough. Maybe we're not asking enough. We're not seeking enough. We're not dreaming enough. Could you imagine the Christians reconciling, you know? Not becoming the same, 
but be becoming reconciled, just like the thumb and the arm and okay, our lungs and livers, okay, we're, we're different, but that there's a diversity that becomes one, unity, like the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, you know, many Christians, many members, one body becoming one. Could you imagine that we become more visibly one in San Antonio? And say, wow, could you, can you believe it? Baptists? And Catholics reconciling and offering each other the sign of peace? And we have our differences. We do. And I, I want to honor them. But I hope this makes sense. There's a lot of misunderstandings. And yeah, I do. I do repent. I can only imagine a lot of proud, prejudiced Catholics have a lot of misunderstandings about the rest of the body of Christ. And that's a sin. And I repent. It's wrong. Help us repent that we renounce the sin of pride and prejudice because it's an offense to God. As scripture says, as iron sharpens iron, so man sharpens man. Right? We're called to sharpen each other as Christians so we can become better. Uh -huh. Could you imagine us reconciling? What I dream of is an upper room. <laughs> Wherever we're gathered is an upper room where we're gathering Christians together and we're listening to each other and we're hearing each other's testimonies and we're giving praise to God for the wonders he's doing. We're learning from each other. We're repenting. We're forgiving. We're, we're reconciling. We're, we're regathering in the upper room to love one another as he loves us. And then we renew the covenant. If you might remember from the Old Testament, it's Joshua. He renews the covenant when they conquer the promised land. And then King Josiah, he renews the covenant. And then after the exile from Babylon, it's Nehemiah and Ezra. They renew the covenant. Could you imagine us Christians of San Antonio renewing the covenant? <laughs> what we stand for and what we stand against. We stand for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior. Huh? We stand together with a family relationship with the Holy Trinity and with his family, the church. We have a family relationship, huh? And we, we stand together to renew the mission of San Antonio. What a great city, San Antonio, huh? See, we're celebrating our 300th anniversary. Actually, it was in 1691 when on the feast of, of, of a great saint from the 1300s, the 1200s, called St. Anthony. And that's okay, so they, they, they called the river San Antonio after him. And then it was on May 1st of 1718, uh -huh. So 300 years ago, when they established the mission, now it's called Alamo, okay, it used to be a mission, and its purpose was to evangelize the land. Could you imagine us Christians making an agreement that we renew the mission to evangelize San Antonio? Come, Holy Spirit, and renew the face of San Antonio. Because I don't know about your families, but in my family, there are many people who do not believe. And if they do not believe in Jesus, what's going to happen to them? Do you ever have that fear? What are going to happen to non-believers? So we, we stand against, we stand against sexual immorality. That is false love, people using and being used. And a lot of people are getting hurt today. We stand against that. We stand against the drug culture of lies. Uh -huh. And we stand against false religion. Okay, you might say, well, wait a minute, Catholics have some false religion. Okay, well, help us, okay? But first remove the log from your own eye, right? Then you can help us remove the speck from our eye. I admit, us Catholics are lacking. We need your help. That's why I'm here. So we help each other, right? To re especially renounce the false religion of atheism, secularism, huh? as if God doesn't exist. And we, we reveal that God is alive by our love for one another. So I want to invite you to hear your own pastor, Pastor Phil. He's coming to St. Mary Magdalene Church to preach and share his testimony. And I really would love if all of you could come. Huh? I don't know if you're free. I hope you are. On, on Saturday, May 19th, it's, uh, it's the eve of Pentecost. 50 days after Easter Sunday is Pentecost Sunday when the Holy Spirit came down. We're going to have a festival of praise. From 7 o'clock at night all the way to midnight, it's, it's a night of praising God. So bring out the violins and the cellos and the flutes and all the Christians. So we're inviting, right, the Pastor Eric's uh, Lutheran church to come. I invite some Pentecostals to come. I, I know we're very different. It's not easy. It's not easy loving one another, right? He knows. He knows right on the cross. He knows. But that's what we're called to. Um, and to hear your, your pastor's testimony. He's a beautiful testimony of mercy. I was, I was like, wow, this is good news that everyone needs to hear this story. Can you come to our church? And so he said yes. And I hope you all can come. It'll be a free event. It'll be in the hall. It's called Jubilee Hall. Um, again, it's just 
on the other side of I-10. And I pray it's just the beginning, little by little, of us learning to love one another so we can become a witness as one testimony, good news for the world. Uh, amen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are your children. And like little children, we make a big mess. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's toys all over the place. <laughs> We've made a mess of your world that you've given us. And we need to teach the world the way back home by being the first to repent, to be the first to ask for forgiveness, to be the first to forgive, to be the first to, to reconcile and make agreement according to your word, according to the will of God, that we become one body again, one baptized body of, of believers, reconciled, making agreement what we stand for and stand against. So Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us and show us how we become one witness, uh, the one gospel, uh, the one light, uh, Jesus Christ, for the world. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.